and created a whole countdown to the end of the earth and destruction. Remember the, the novel series and the movies that were made out of it called Left Behind? That's what that was all about. That the rapture would take those who are faithful to Christ, would sort of suck them up into heaven while everybody else was left to die un, in agonizing, unimaginable, glory ways. Sells a lot of movies. Uh, the unfortunate thing is it's just wrong. It totally misses the, the point of the book Revelation. So a number of years ago, uh, there was a New Testament scholar whose focus, whose specialty is the book of Revelation. She was so outraged by the, the series and how popular it was becoming. She wrote a book called Ra The Rapture Exposed. Her name is Barbara Rossi. In fact, our Tuesday book study group read it a few years ago. And she essentially says, if you don't understand the milieu, the context in which John was writing and of which he was critiquing, it's easy to miss the whole point of the book. Yes, it is filled with disturbing images of war and battle and blood and dragons and stars falling out of the sky and plagues. But it is all a critique on the power of this world, which John was experiencing. I said we went to these cities that were addressed in Revelation, these seven cities. Some of them were expansive ruins restored. Others were just sort of holes in the ground, literally, with a few stones. But I think we could all sense the amazing grandeur of what they were like in their height. Pretty impressive even for a 21st century American. They were stupendous. And this is what Rome did. Rome was built on subjugating the peoples of the earth, destroying the nations of the earth to make them the one Roman Empire. So they would go in and they would either build these cities or they would rebuild them after they had destroyed the previous ones. And they would wow everywhere. Uh, there would be expansive uh, walls and gates that were impenetrable. There would be uh, lights at night. We forget about that. They, they, some of these cities were lit up for miles around with the torches that burned so that that power of Rome would always be remembered. They were uh, bedecked with temples all over the place, up on the Acropolises, the, 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 the main hills. And especially a uh, temple to one god in particular, which should ring familiar to those of us in Portland. Any guess as to which god, I should say goddess, was so prevalent? Nike! <laughs> Did you all know Nike is the, uh, the Greek goddess of victory? And hence, Nike. But with Rome, it was the essence of Rome. Rome was victory. It was futile to, to stand up against Rome and Nike. And we heard about her all over the place. In fact, in Ephesus, we saw a wonderful sort of bas-relief carving. A lot of us took pictures to give to our Nike friends. Um, don't stand up to Rome because you will lose. This was the insanity of the world that John lived in, and I might add it's the insanity of the world which we live in. Our presiding bishop, our new presiding bishop, has a wonderful phrase he talks about all the time, calling us to replace the nightmare of this world with the dream of God. And that, essentially, is what the book of Revelation is about. Because, yes, there's all that warfare and, and gore, but it's all to show that that power of the world is futile. Because the main character in Revelation, we sang about it uh, in that opening hymn, the main character is the victorious lamb. It's Jesus, who is also the sacrificial lamb. So any victory in the Christian community comes through the self-offering, sacrificial love of Christ. That's what conquers, not the ways of this world. And in, in, in finally, in the last two chapters of the book, we get the total vision 
of what God's dream for the world is. And it's nothing to do with that rapture theology which says that the, the righteous will be swept away and protected up in heaven while everybody else is punished and the earth is destroyed. No, that's not the vision. If you want to understand the book, always go to the last few chapters of the book. And the rapturists tend to forget that. We heard it. We heard it today. We didn't hear all of it. Because it explicitly says, not that God will take the faithful out of the world, but that God will come and dwell among them. In their midst. And so John's vision is, yes, a city. That's what he was surrounded by, these cities of Rome coming down out of heaven, but it is not like any city of Rome that he had seen, because the gates are always open. There is no night, so they don't need to burn the, the, the torches. And there's no temple in the city, because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb, Jesus, are the temple. And then there's that wonderfully rich image of the, at the center of the city is the river of the water of life. And on either side of the river grows the tree of life. And of course you can't go to Turkey without hearing all about Turkish carpets. And so many of them have this wonderful design of the tree of life. It bears fruit in every season. And then John says what my favorite part of that, that passage is, and the leaves of the tree or for the healing of the nations. That's the dream of God. Not the destruction of the nations. Not the rapturing away of a few while everyone else suffers. But God dwelling in the midst of the city and healing the world. And let me tell you, we got glimpses of that all around our pilgrimage. I think it began for me in the ancient church of Hagia Sophia, Holy Wisdom, and to stand in that amazing place which was worshipped in as a Christian church for almost a thousand years, and then as a, a mosque, and now uh, as a museum open to all. But you look up and you see these medallions up in the ceiling. Up near the ceiling on one side in Arabic is the name of God, Allah. On the other side in Arabic is the name Muhammad. And then you look right in the middle of them up to the ceiling behind it in the apse. And still there, over the centuries, you see the icon of the Blessed Virgin holding Jesus, blessing the world. A glimpse of the healing of the nations. I saw that in the, in the uh, Blue Mosque, just a few steps down the street with its devotion and reverence. We saw it in the friendliness and the smiles and the hospitality of people all over the country. For me, one of the most profound uh, glimpses of that was when we visited the, uh, the tiny little place held to be the House of Mary. When, you know, when, when Jesus was crucified, he entrusted his mother to John, uh, the beloved disciple. And John uh, spent his last years in, after being exiled to Patmos, he came back in Ephesus. And it is presumed that Mary was with him. And I uh, won't go into the details of why they think this is the spot where she lived to her final days on this earth. Um, but a quiet, serene spot. And once a year, on her feast day in August, Christians and Muslims come together and worship, giving thanks for the mother and honoring the mother of their Lord and their prophet. Jesus is a prophet of Islam. And in fact, I always get a surprise from people when I point out that Mary is mentioned more in the Quran than in Christian scripture. That is the healing of the nations. We saw it again when we were coming back to Istanbul, going through the Gallipoli Peninsula where so many young, really boys, ages 17 to 23, gave their lives in World War I. Mostly Australians and New Zealanders uh, who were uh, attacking the Gallipoli coast. They lost over 7,000 young men that day in April. We were there for the anniversary of it. The Turks lost something like 17,000, even though they won that battle. Of course, they lost the war. But all these years later, every year on the anniversary of that insane 
carnage. Australians and New Zealanders travel to Gallipoli and join with the Turks who together mourn their young men who lost their lives. And they remember that nightmare of the world can be replaced with the dream of God. And so, this day as we celebrate the healing mass, and some of you will come forward for prayers of healing for yourself, others might sit in meditation, but I encourage you to hold in your hearts not only uh, prayers for yourself, but for the world. Jesus asked the young man in the gospel, do you wish to be made well? And that's the question he asked each of us. Do you want to be made well? Yes, in your body, in your heart, in your spirit, in your mind, in your relationships. But do you also, Jesus asked this, for the world? Do we want our country to be made well? Do we want the nations of the earth to be made well? Do we want a vision of that, uh, that once a year occurrence at the House of Mary? Let ISIS put that in their pipe and smoke it. Do you want to be made well? So let us come for healing, offering ourselves, praying for those whom we love, but praying for the nightmare of this world, that it may be changed into the dream of God.